Welcome everyone to the next uh, session of the conference. Um, in the previous sessions, we've heard from speakers from this continent and from the US, Mexico and Palestine about the law as both a tool of oppression and violence and colonization, but also about how the law might be used to build power. In Australia, from its very foundation, prisons and criminal law have been used as a tool of colonization. And since then, First Nations and those with lived experience have been leading the fight to end racist carceral systems. Ruth Wilson Gilmore said that prison abolition seeks to undo the way of thinking and doing things that sees prison and punishment as solutions for all kinds of social, economic, political, behavioural and interpersonal problems. Abolition, though, is not simply decarceration, put everyone out on the street. It is reorganising how we live our lives together in the world. It is my great privilege and honour to be able to introduce two incredible people, Debbie Kilroy and Alison Whitaker, to speak on this session, Abolitionist Lawyering, Using the Law to Dismantle Carceral Systems. Really unfortunately, Tabitha Lean, Gunter Jamara's storyteller, writer, poet and abolition activist has had to pull out at the last minute due to personal reasons, but I really recommend following her work. Debbie Kilroy is the founder and CEO of Sisters Inside, which advocates for the human rights of women and girls affected by the criminal legal system. She was first imprisoned at age 13 and spent the subsequent 20 years moving in and out of women and children's prisons in Queensland. In 2007, Debbie was the first person in Australia with serious convictions to be admitted to practice law by the Supreme Court of Queensland. Alison Whitaker is a Gomorrah law academic, essayist and poet. She's a senior researcher at the Jambuna Institute at UTS and her second book, Black Work, was released with Magabala Books in September 2018. And um, for this session, uh, the chat function is open to everyone. Um, our panellists have invited you to comment in the chat in answer to the question, what does prison abolition mean to you? Um, we're also going to um, have time for audience Q&A um, after we go through some questions. So um, if you could type your Q&A in the separate Q&A function, that will help me to be able to distinguish the chat from the Q&A. Um, I'll start by asking Debbie the first question. Um, Debbie, you've described prison abolition as an imaginative project. Can you um, describe to us what this means, what brought you to abolition? Oh, sorry, Debbie, you're just on mute. Sorry. Um, okay, sorry, I'm a little bit techno twit, so hopefully that's on. <laughs> um, thanks, Sarah. So before I start, I do want to acknowledge traditional custodians of Mianjin here, uh, where I sit today, and acknowledge and pay my respects to elders uh, past and present, the Turrbal and the Yagara people. I uh, reside on Nulumpur land that runs what we call uh, White Ways, uh, South Brisbane, down to Minjirabar, otherwise known as Strabroke Island. Um, so I am fortunate enough to um, be able to place my feet on beautiful country of many nations. I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations people of this country um, and where everyone comes from today. Um, their creativity, survival and resistance under colonisation and, an and that is an abolitionist practice. When I imagine a world without the violence of policing and prisons and child theft, the so-called criminal punishment system, I imagine a world in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait women and girls, children, people will feel free and will flourish. That would commence with handing back to the rightful owners their land. As a white woman, a settler in this place, I must resist being complicit in colonisation and white supremacy which continues to kill Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, children and men. These systems undermine all of our safety. All of us who are settlers in this place must step up and show up to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in collective struggles against colonisation. This is a key part of what it means to imagine and work towards a world without the violence of policing, prisons, child theft and the criminal punishment system, any carceral system. When the abolition of the prison industrial complex requires a wholesale restructuring of the world as we know it, it is a transformative project, an opportunity for us to recalibrate and 
uh, within our relationships with each other, with property, with the country we occupy and with the state. We are going to need to use our imagination because we have internalised the pull to vengeance. And this pull to vengeance is an impulse to the colonial racist castle state. We begin to think we will only feel better, safer even, if we can make the person who hurts us feel the way we do. It's why I am asked at every panel I sit on, talking about abolition, the same question about some mythological violence that might happen in the future. But what about murderers and the rapists? And it's a valid question. However, the system we have now doesn't stop murder and rape. So we must stop relying on that failed system. But I also recognise that the question is only asked because we are so limited in our scope of imagining justice that we default to not only the worst violence that we can imagine, but also the only way of achieving justice that, um, that we can fathom. We are limited by what we are told is possible by the state, and it is in the best interest of the race, racist capitalist state to limit our imaginations. As Morgan Bashis reminds us that, quote, the very systems we are working to dismantle live inside us, unquote. It is so easy to look outward and critique an institution or a system than it is to look inward and be honest with ourselves and work to dismantle the dangerous carceral logics embedded in our own selves. With urgency, each and every one of us must do the work and dismantle and abolish the carceral state, being that we are here and living within it in our own selves. With, a, with urgency, each and every one of us must do the work and dismantle and abolish the carceral state. The abolition of the prison industrial complex, however, opens up uh, every single possibility. First, it gives us the opportunity to work to change the conditions which produce harm and people who harm. We have an opportunity to transform communities and eradicate the structures that enable racist and misogynist violence in the first place. And then it gives us an opportunity to consider what healing and accountability could really look like. Because prisons are not sites of accountability, they're mechanisms for the disavowal of accountability. That's the transformative part. And the other part is that abolition is something you embody. It is an everyday practice. It is not a destination we arrive at. Every single day, we have to work to refuse the creep of the carceral and punitive logic in our own lives, our homes, our relationships, our communities. And in order to unlearn the old ways, the ways that we have internalised, swallowed and not challenged, we have to get creative, we have to imagine new, new ways and we have to heal ourselves individually and collectively to move forward. New ways to love each other, to relate to each other, to care for each other, this country, our communities. We cannot be limited by what the colonial racist capitalist state tells us. We have to break free of their bonds and that is where the magic lays for me. And I want us to be reminded of my sister's beautiful words, and I heard her again today, Ruthie Wilson, Wilson Gilmore, just to remind everybody, and if we can hold this in the forefront of our minds and we think about the abolition of the prison industrial complex, life is precious, life is precious. What an opening. Thank you so much, Debbie. I think um, in thinking of sort of that imaginative project, um, I wanted to ask you, Alison, you've spoken about the difference between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms. Can you describe what that means in the context of abolition? Yeah, absolutely I can. Um, first, I just want to take a chance to acknowledge uh, the country that I'm on today. So I'm here on Gadigal and Mongol country. And I want to take a chance to acknowledge their elders and ancestors who continue to hold and practice sovereignty over this place regardless of whether or not um, the legal systems that have put themselves here and implanted themselves here um, recognise it. And I want to echo also what Debbie has said in that fantastic, powerful introduction that I think kind of floored me a bit, knocked the wind out of me, is that um, the, the struggle for abolition, the push towards abolition, is also a, a push towards 
decolonization. And those two have to always be linked because those two um, dual forces that they're working against, the colony and the carceral system, are one and the same and they empower one another. Um, but to return to your question, <laughs> Sarah, and to be more specific about it, I think it's really critical to understand what we talk about when we're talking about reformism. So abolition uh, stands counter to reformism. Reformism uh, are kind of structural changes that are made to um, the carceral complex that Debbie was just describing that um, you might be more familiar with lawyers in the chat um, who, if you've encountered them um, in practice or if you've encountered them as part of uh, being part of a civil society that continually pushes for reformist changes. Reformist changes um, try to change or alter the conditions of prison without actually targeting the central logic of a prison, which is um, the detention, the incarceration, the disposal of full people in communities. Um, so reformism in trying to change those conditions makes nicer prisons, regulates prisons, tinkers at the edge of that violence that Debbie was describing. Um, instead of uh, actually challenging the legitimacy of prisons to actually have that right to detain people in the first place. And the phrase non-reformist reform comes to understand what the role in the day-to-day -day, um, of small changes can be in the project of abolition, which Debbie, I've heard you describe in the past as kind of like a path that we're we're all going on as abolitionists practice towards abolition. So non-reformist reforms are reforms that don't leave carceral institutions intact. They curtail powers that carceral institutions have in a meaningful way rather than seeking to regulate or legitimize or soften them. Um, and they are really committed to not expanding the carceral project in any way. And so when you see reformist reforms, you see a lot of the dangers that we see in actually expanding the carceral complex that Debbie was describing, um, especially with an example that might be familiar to people is the use of uh, home detention and electronic surveillance instead of uh, releasing people to their own rightful freedom. Um, and that was posed as, I guess, like a softer alternative, quote unquote, uh, to having people in bricks and mortar prisons, but actually what it did was transform communities, homes, uh, and the world at large into huge open air prisons that are inescapable um, and entrap us all. Um, you also see this really common refrain and the, the continent of Australia and its governments are especially, uh, sorry, the, the colony of Australia and its governments are especially good at doing this, which is creating conditions in prisons that are unlivable through overcrowding, terrible sanitation, really, really punitive impulses designed to humiliate and degrade and punish people. And then posing the, the alternative to that, to expanding prisons, making larger wings to avoid that overcrowding complex. And so that's an example of uh, reformist reform. These things actually make the prison complex that Debbie was describing much larger, much more complex, and center its legitimacy rather than challenging what's at the middle of it. But non-reformist reforms um, accept abolition as the path reject that kind of central condition of prisons and their right to detain um, and to also destroy communities in the process. And they kind of treat their task as chipping away at the armour of this complex um, and building capacity as well for, for future pathways that will open up for abolition as we continue to develop that imaginary that uh, Debbie was describing. Um, one really topical, uh, newsworthy, um, non-reformist reform that happened this week, occurred in South Australia, championed by Latoya Rule, uh, an Aboriginal Māori uh, academic, uh, activist, um, force of nature, who brought South Australian Parliament to bear uh, in passing the, through the upper house, the, the first all settings, um, all persons, ban on the use of spit hoods as a restraint in not only carceral settings, but medical carceral settings as well, um, and policing settings in addition to that. Um, and that is such a, a powerful example of a non-reformist reform um, because it restrains the act of the state in being able to wound and degrade people in the way that using the spit hood did, um, as well as opening up future chances for um, limiting future uses of restraint. Um, as I think a lot of the, the discussion around the Spit Hoods ban this week, which passed, I think, from memory on Wednesday night, is that 
what has happened is that that state power to use spit hoods in um, Latoya's brother's case, Wayne Feller Morrison, with fatal consequence has now been effectively cut off. South Australia has a future, um, an abolitionist future in just one small respect where the use of spit hoods is no longer feasible, no longer possible. And that also gives us hope that other changes can be similarly pushed through. Um, and that brings lots of excitement um, to me as an abolitionist to see these things happening in real time um, and to see First Nations people like Latoya and their family actually being able to push that through and to lead the charge. Um, I think I'll leave my point there. So powerful and such a powerful example of um, real huge change that can be fought by um, families. Um, so important. Sort of thinking more about um, you know, these opportunities for change and, and for really um, engaging in non-reformist reforms. Um, Debbie, in your work as a lawyer, what does being a lawyer and being an abolition, abolitionist mean to you? Um, how can or can lawyers really practice abolition? Yeah, thanks. Um, just um, housekeeping, we were going to turn the chat on, but it doesn't look like it's on. Can someone turn it on if they're listening and can do that, please? So people can participate while we're talking. I don't, I don't know who has that control, but. I have sent a message to our amazing tech team, so hopefully they. Um, they might hear us say that now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I think the real failure of lawyers is in our vision. Um, in uh, our understanding of politics, our understanding of organising and our understanding of power, the way that we've tried to use the you know, legal system, or as I call it, the punishment system, to change what is really a problem of racial capitalism and white supremacy and colon uh, colonialism and power in this country. Um, the colonial racist punishment system in this country has never been an institution of radical social change. Um, so, uh, to the contrary, it has been an instrument of the ruling class's oppression. Um, the punishment system from its founding was about preserving uh, distributions of wealth and property and white supremacy and furthering the colonial racist project. Um, as lawyers, we need to join the abolition uh, movement because that is a movement that can change the power dynamics of our society. The law cannot do that and we cannot do that as lawyers. And unless uh, us as agents of the carceral state are part of that movement, part of the social movement that changes the way we think about punishment and exile, power and consequence, I don't suspect that we're going to be able to fundamentally alter the architecture of incarceration and punishment in this country. Because frankly, uh, what is at stake right now is whether we will actually make big changes to dismantle the violence of policing and the violence of prison, or whether we'll make little tiny tweaks that curve off some of its most grotesque flourishes that preserve the architecture of the punishment, bureaucracy and of human caging. Now, I got into law to not only dismantle the punishment system, but to infiltrate and find allies to join us in abolishing the prison industrial complex. Most importantly, to liberate people, not to have them locked up. I started my law degree when I was still a prisoner. There are many ways that lawyers can practice abolition. One way, um, it, well, probably a priority, I would even say, is that you need to end your part in being an alibi for this punishment system. Lawyers are trained to be alibis of the state so that you protect the colonial racist project. So stop being an ally and stop being an alibi, both of those things, for the state. Be an ally for us here, down in the grassroots, in the trenches, fighting to stop the end of the brutality on those that are criminalised and imprisoned. There are many other ways that lawyers can practise abolition too, and one is about the use of your language. Often we find ourselves employing language of the punishment system as opposed to the language of humanity um, when we're in court, and I would say not only in court but out in the free world, but we're talking about lawyers in court. The things that we write, the arguments that we make, it's almost like reading from police reports that we use words like suspect, defendant, offender, criminal, and we use the propagandistic terms of like Department of Corrections, um, 
and the criminal just so-called justice system. We even use the word hold to describe someone who's in a cage, which is a strange thing to say. You hold someone you love. Holding is a term of care. Or we use terms like law enforcement, which makes it seem like we enforce all laws against all people, when in fact law enforcement is this country just enforces some laws against some people and allows the continuation of the violence of policing in this country. Mm -hmm. The language that we use is really important. Language is a site of struggle and we have the opportunity to centre someone's humanity. So we all need, as lawyers, and our privilege to be able to walk into a courtroom and to be heard, to step up and centre our clients' humanity in everything we do. So powerful in this, you know, you're, what you've spoken about in terms of the language of the law being a site of struggle and the work of lawyers as a site of struggle, um, I think really ties into so much of the, what we've heard throughout the conference. Um, Alison, Derek Bell coined the term interest convergence. Can you tell us what that means in the context of lawyers and some examples of the ways that lawyers can really be of service to abolitionist organising? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about interest convergence. But first I wanted to turn back to something that Deb said that was really powerful is that every, by, by virtue of our discipline, by virtue of being uh, practitioners, in, in my case, researchers, in the, the discipline of law and of punishment systems, it is so easy unless you are very attentive and constantly um, in that process. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but of like checking yourself um, you're going to find yourself slipping very easily into complicity even if you think you're acting on abolitionist values. It's not enough to work to an abolitionist end. Well, I mean, that is a core value. Um, but it's also necessary as part of that to have an abolitionist practice and how we get there. Um, I'm really interested, and I, I think a lot of other First Nations lawyers and legal researchers who are abolitionists, uh, going back to these early texts by Professor Derek Bell, um, who is, I guess, you would, um, one of the, the major grandfathers, one of the major um, champions, birthers of critical race theory, um, and one of the thinkers, I think, that we have to defend as long as critical race theory is under attack. Um, but he coined the term interest convergence when he was talking about civil rights litigation in the context of racial justice, specifically in the context of what it meant to be black in America and to be faced with um, this ongoing practice of civil litigation, contesting your rights and your place in the world. Um, Derek Bell, I probably shouldn't refer to him by his first name, Professor Bell was talking about this case called Brown versus Board of Education, which some people here might be familiar with. It's uh, the case that's widely credited with uh, ending the practice of separate but equal segregation. And um, Professor Bell spent a lot of time living in the shadow of Brown Board of Education um, in also cultivating his own strategic litigation practice. Um, and he came to question the value of something that many people have regarded to be a really seminal decision, something that marked the turn um, of particularly litigative agency for, for black Americans. Um, and he questioned its capacity to deliver lasting change because what, what he observed at this kind of um, operational practice by which Brown Board of Education was undone um, in that the, the actual precedent it set didn't necessarily matter as long as the social and economic conditions effectively empowered um, the white settler colonial legal establishment to reinforce um, the very conditions in which Brown versus Board of Education was fighting against. Um, so he was talking about an interest convergence, the idea that change is only forced when there are intersecting interests in the claims that we make for justice, in the, the claims that we make and all the motivations and economic factors and social impact behind them, as well as um, the values here. I'm going to important to that kind of First Nations sovereignty as being a core value. And then over here, the courts and the, the establishment of power to which we appeal. And it's only in, um, Professor Bell says, that that intersection in which change is, that change is actually realised and it's not always consistently on our terms. And it's very not only very, very easy to wind back, but it's often only rhetorical and it's often only conceded to the extent in which there is interest from this centre of power in actually giving it back. 
Um, and that's relevant to abolitionist practice, I think, because of this, um, and Debbie was talking about it too in her introduction to the topic, this idea that First Nations sovereignty is at odds with the prison, um, but it's also um, the prison is uh, at odds, sorry, the Australian courts are both at odds with First Nations sovereignty and the abolition of prisons. So it's very, very, very difficult through this kind of explosive um, civil litigation model that Brown versus Board of Education followed, but also that a lot of young lawyers, uh, and particularly social justice lawyers, are interested in following, that model actually might not necessarily deliver what we want to do because what actually, and what has been described in earlier panels today and in keynotes yesterday, the change is actually coming from the social organising that brings those interests together and that continually pushes the margin as far as we can get it. Um, and it's also, it opens up, even though it's a very pessimistic idea, um, this idea that um, the, the courts to which we find ourselves appealing by the nature of the power of law um, will never have an interest at heart and can only really change the rhetoric in which our oppression is done. Um, while that's quite pessimistic, it also does open up opportunity for rethinking what the role of lawyers are in movement lawyering. Um, and even though I am not myself an organiser, I'm also not a, a practising lawyer at this point. Um, I think I have maybe a, a couple of pointers further to, to what Deb has suggested. Practical ways in which um, lawyers on this continent, legal practitioners, but also organisers, um, can actually be of service to, to abolitionist movements. Um, and Debbie, chime in if I've missed anything, because um, Debbie's effectively the one who's kind of built the model for doing this on this continent. Um, uh, the first thing I would suggest is um, don't diminish that direct service work, um, which we're often taught is very kind of small piecemeal work um, in movement lawyering and in um, social justice lawyering. Um, tending to the small impact that you can make in somebody else's life, especially if that is the small impact that will get them out of a carceral context, mitigate the impact of a carceral context or stop them coming into contact with a prison. And that's stuff like um, direct defence, if the person finds themselves um, presenting to court, uh, but it also includes things like housing support, discrimination claims, um, welfare support, all of these systems that people should be by default able to rely on. Lawyers are uniquely equipped as effectively glorified administrators, sorry if that's not generous, um, to be able to navigate these systems and to mitigate these impacts as much as possible. And that is the model that a lot of abolitionist legal centres are taking precisely because the impact is so powerful, so direct, and it also opens up opportunities for abolitionist organising as communities get empowered. When Debbie earlier was talking about um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore saying, you know, when life is precious, life is precious. Um, and the other, the other thing that really inspires me that Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about is this idea of abolitionist presence. We are building, as we're building for the deconstruction of prisons and police, we're also pushing for a world that we want in its place. Um, not in its place, not to replace it, but to supplant it, to plant something um, in the demolished buildings, to plant something within a, a rethought society that Debbie was describing earlier. Um, and direct service work is a really, really critical way that we can actually do that as lawyers, that we can facilitate the world that we want to have and facilitate it in people who stand the most to gain um, from the demolition of prison industrial complex, um, but also who stand to lose the most if we fail to create that world. Um, it's also, um, and Debbie touched on it briefly in a really, really powerful way, it's not just what we elect to do as lawyers, but also what we exercise our power of refusal to do that can be really important as abolitionist practice as lawyers. Um, so the easy ones, don't work for police and corrections. Um, if you're a prosecutor, don't be a prosecutor. Quit on Monday. I don't think there'll be any in this chat. Um, you don't work for the companies that work for them. You think really critically, and I know there's going to be a funding um, conversation, I think, later in the day. You don't, if to the extent to which you can control it, I know as young lawyers there are a lot of people pushing against this tendency. You don't take philanthropic funds that are connected to prisons or police. You don't take philanthropic funds from people who fund any kind of project that funnels people into police uh, or into prisons or into any other carceral system, including child protection that Debbie was describing. 
Um, and that's really, really difficult to do. I know a lot of people who are in this chat, um, I have this little sneaky list, of, look at the list of people who are watching, uh, are doing this work. Um, and I know it's really, really disheartening because um, the whole community legal sector is effectively built on dirty money, um, rounds of funding from governments who have an investment in the production of police and prisons. Um, but I want you to know that I see the work that you're doing. It's really, really critical. Um, and I think if we keep doing it, it's going to make a lasting change to the model of lawyering that risks being complicit in that. Um, two other things, I know I'm being a time hog. Um, go out and support abolitionist movements. Um, some, uh, one of the really exciting things that we saw kind of come up in um, mid-2020 was this resurgence in direct action on the streets for Black Lives Matter. Um, and it was thrilling to see it take place, especially because it was taking place, at least where I, where I am, in Gadigal and Mongol country, taking place at tremendous legal risk to the participants. It was actually um, for, for the tens of thousands of people who turned up at the Sydney rally on June 6th, was actually posing direct criminal legal risk to each and every attendant, uh, sorry, person present. Um, and one of the key mitigation strategies that lawyers were able to do at the time and that we managed to organise within 18 to 12 hours was to actually have legal observer teams monitoring police activity, not to endorse it, not to regulate it, but to make sure that anyone impacted by police brutality at that rally, and that includes the brutality of authorised uses of power, to make sure that they would have the legal defence that they would require if it came to it. Um, and that observing practice became useful when it came to uses of force that people might have seen, like the pepper spraying underground at Central Station. Um, and I'm pleased to say that across the continent, there are legal observing teams who are doing this really critical work, including down in Melbourne with the Melbourne Activist Legal, I always get this wrong, it's not a service, support, Melbourne Activist Legal Support, um, and with Counteract as well, trying to coordinate things on a national level. Um, and that's a really fantastic way that lawyers can support this by mitigating, if not fully removing, the legal risk of people participating in advocacy that opens up an abolitionist future um, and that could let rallies take place um, that opened up a conversation um, that we would not have otherwise had I think at a national level in mainstream media, were it not for the masses of people in the streets led by First Nations people who said Black Lives Matter. Um, and my final point in my long tirade is that um, as lawyers, as practitioners, as researchers, there's a structural incentive to just encounter people who are in contact with the criminal legal system as clients or as people who are, we are serving or acting for, acting on behalf of, it's really, really critical that you just don't encounter people who have had contact with the criminal justice, sorry, criminal legal system. See how easy it is to fall in? Criminal legal system, um, not just encountering them as clients and not because there's any deficiency in encountering them as people who in any particular moment need a legal service that you can provide. But also you should be talking with people who are organising in this space who have had that lived experience. You should be getting behind them so that we're not, in addition to doing that amazing direct service work, we're making ourselves as useful as possible to that much larger project of abolition and that we're deferring to um, the experiences of people who have lived experience inside and who know what has to change in order for not just prisons to crumble, but for a better thing to flourish in their place. So powerful. I don't know, Debbie, do you want to jump in? I assume you've got a lot to say. <laughs> no, I'm just um, inspired by Ali and your powerful words and messages um, to everybody out here in the free world. Um, such an inspiration and great work that you do every day. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and to you, not to turn this into a love-in, but... Um... No, but, you know, like, um, it's true. And I think if we can't, if I can't say what I want to say to you from my heart um, at any time, even here in a conference, then, you know, we are trying to change the world and how we do things differently. We don't need to be stiffs as the world expects us to be. <laughs> so it's about, yes, thank you, much, Lee. <laughs> Thank you to you too, Deb. Sarah, do you mind if I ask Deb a question? Absolutely not. Please go ahead. 
Uh, Deb, one of the other first things um, that you taught me was the role of decarceration in abolition. Um, and that's been really critical for, for me in being able to understand the difference between like reformism and non-reformist reforms and also to how we can make abolition look real in our time, even in just a really, really small way, accepting it's a long project. Could you talk a little bit about how you modelled that? Sure. So um, I was, I'm happy to move because it'll cover the next question pretty much too, because um, the right. next question was about system design, but that's okay. Um, no, no, because decarceration, uh, you know, sometimes um, we describe, well, lots of times describe abolition, abolition is the destiny and decarceration is the journey. But decarceration doesn't mean just getting people out and dumping them on the streets, right? It's about changing all the things. Um, you know, like, like Ruthie says um, when asked the question, what do we need to change? Well, we need to change everything, everything. Um, so it's about, again, looking at the social, political, behavioural, interpersonal, economical issues that everyone struggles in, um, racism within this capitalist world that we live in that fails predominantly nearly all of us, except a, a very small percentage of the billionaires that hold most of the wealth in the world. Um, and we know that if they distributed, if the wealth was distributed, there would be no poverty. And so, um, you know, I continue to lobby here, for example, with this government and um, and in the legal legal committees that I sit on, that we need to have a, a task force, uh, an inquiry into poverty because poverty will look at everything from um, land theft to racism to not enough food to not enough safe housing anything you could you know the destruction of our environment everything that we could possibly imagine poverty would cover and some politicians are like interested but they're mm, I don't think we can do that because it will expose them no doubt Mm -hmm. and, and the and the you know the carceral mechanisms but um so decarceration so everything we do at sisters inside it it starts and it moves from decarceration so anything we're going to do has to be thought about whatever our action is is decarceration so it's not about net widening it's not about reformist agenda agenda um so you know and as when you were talking i was thinking of a few things about the welfare industrial complex which also needs to be dismantled which mm -hmm. is a problem as well because there's many people that are making money on the backs of the most marginalized people in our communities um and they use carceral um, responses all the time um, in regards to when they're supposed to be providing support or services um, for people in our community but it's always on their terms so you know um, social workers for example and other welfare type workers are trained in the framework of case management where case management comes from a position of power over not power with and so that's why we've developed our own frameworks here we use an inclusive support model that we've built ourselves with and for criminalised and prison women and girls about how, and that's why, um, you know, Sisters Inside, our, our model works because we're not coming from a position of power over, it's about a position of power with. And um, we don't, we have never called the police, we have never called any carceral response ever into our organisation onto any woman, child or family. You know, I, um, I was uh, thinking, you know, one a staff member here and you know we have a number of staff a number of women employed here engaged here that have been in prison themselves have been criminalized um, more than half of our staff are aboriginal and torres strait islander women um I, so it's that's really important and i was thinking um we had a social worker employed here um just as an example and she was working with uh an aboriginal woman and but the Aboriginal woman wouldn't let her in her house. That's okay. Um, but, and she kept trying. And anyway, so she came back here and she said to me, I think the baby is in trouble, like a, a fairly newborn baby, in trouble inside the house. That's why she's not letting me in. And I'm worried the baby's going to die. And I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, what do you mean? And so we went through this process at one stage she said to me can you stop questioning like me like a lawyer I was trying to get the information <laughs> anyway but about where she got this idea about this that the baby was going to die right and it came from neighbors and gossip and all these things and she's saying we need to call the police we need to call child protection I said we are not calling the police we are not calling child protection and I will take full responsibility 
you know, in the lead role at Sisters about that. And I went home, obviously this was all afternoon and um, there was a number of us around the table trying to work out what to do, the strategy, how we're going to do this, you know, to look after mum, to look after baby, to make sure everything's all right without using the violence of policing or any other form of state violence. And I remember, like, I didn't sleep at all that night. And, you know, my question over and over in my head is, what is an ab what You're an abolitionist, Deborah. What would you do? What would an abolitionist do? Think outside the bars. Think outside the violence. You know, I have to keep asking myself the question. And, then, and I eventually, at like 3 a.m. in the morning, came up with the idea that, okay, I know how to do this. So I'm, on the way to work, I actually rang the woman because I knew her. And, um, and she said to me, Oh my God, Debbie, what have I done? Why are you ringing me? She was like worried that I'd run her, right? I said, no, no, nothing, nothing. I actually wanted to see if you, because um, we have a position here. It's called um, an Indigenous cultural um, leader, which is one of the Aboriginal elders that we pay to be engaged at Sisters Inside to ensure that we are working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, girls, families and children to lead us as an organisation as um, you know, employees, as white fellows with those checks and balances that we're, we're you know, working within the community um, in an appropriate way. And um, I said, because uh, Arnie Beverly knew um, this woman and one of the other staff members had worked with her, and I said, oh, you know, um, ex-staff member and Arnie Beverly would like to come and have morning tea with you today. That's what I was bringing up about. Is that okay? Because um, we're just a bit worried about you and baby to see if he's are okay. She goes, oh, no, that'd be great. Anyway, so they were immediately in the car, went down, picked her up, baby up. She came out of the house. They went to a coffee shop. They had morning tea. They had a cry. They had a laugh. They hugged each other. Baby was fine, you know. And so it's about how we can escalate because of the carceral mechanisms that we swallow and become part of our subconscious being that comes out in our actions, that if any other organisation would have called the cops, would have called child safety, that baby would have been removed, she may never have probably have ever got her child back. And if we, and also if we did that, the, dis, the trust that we breach. So it's about some would be freaking out probably on the chat line <laughs> that you should have called the cops, you should have done it in case what happens if the baby did die well that was you know i took that on board very seriously as you know ali as abolitionists we take violence on very seriously seriously people think that because you're an abolitionist you actually don't take violence seriously and where we do take it very very seriously and where we struggle each day of our lives about how to respond to harm and how to stop harm, reduce harm, and not be harmful. And they are real struggles that all of us have to take on board in a community that is about harm and violence. So, yeah, so it's about thinking and unpacking our own carceral um, mechanisms, structures, actions that we've swallowed ourselves and not act on them. It, it's, you know, it's like racism. We, you know, I know when the racist words, I feel them come up right because i've been socialized and i can go stop this now it's the same thing when it you coming up with castle anytime a castle response to be an mm -hmm. abolitionist don't you must be anti-racist <laughs> you, you must be part of the you know the movement to abolish the prison industrial complex the welfare industrial complex any type of mechanism that uses castle strategies to deal and intervene in people's lives because that is a violent intervention that we are enacting on another human being. And uh, we must stop the violence, all of our violence. Lawyers are very violent. You know, I see in court. Um, and sometimes when you use that word, people think like hitting. I'm not talking about that type of violence. I'm talking about the emotional violence, the power violence that impacts on people that you represent in a court. I have seen lawyers standing in front of judicial officers with woman, a woman that they're representing crying because they're terrified they're going to prison and the way that the lawyer engages with the judicial officers throw their pen up in the air, up, down, up, down. And not like it's a game when she's totally distressed and traumatised about what's going to happen in her life and whether she's going to be you know, locked up in prison or not. We've got to be aware in the position of our power 
as lawyers what our actions do and how they violate another human being that's that's within the criminal punishment system i don't know i think i said many things there but um so decarceration is this action that i'm taking is it actually going to cause more harm or less harm yeah mm. thank you so much debbie i think from what the chat blew up and mainly, you know, all in support. I think that people are really, it's got people really thinking about sort of the decision, the personal decisions we make and how they're also linked to violence and punishment in the carceral system. And it's not just about sort of big ideas, it's about how we can enact that in our daily lives. Um, one question that someone posed in the chat, which I thought is really relevant, and I know I'm veering off the set questions. Um, is about um, the recent campaign um, to criminalise coercive control. And I wonder whether um, you might speak to that um, as sort of another, uh, you know, campaign that's been enacted um, that, you know, reinforces carceral system. You want to go early? Oh, you wrote the submission, Dev. <laughs> Um, I think, so I'll speak in very general terms and then um, Debbie, I won't, I won't press you, but I think um, your submission would be incredible to speak to. Um, the, the tendency to resolve um, anything that has to do with a particular kind of violence and to treat its resolution as if um, a successful prosecution is the desirable end and is even a deterrent in these kind of matters. Uh, is really, really troubling. Um, and I think as feminists, we should resist it. We should resist um, the idea that expanding a particular kind of um, violence system to redress another is going to be um, even thinking from a completely inhumane, detached, um, strategic point of view is going to mean that we're going to be fighting these same battles from system to system and be chasing them forever. Um, without actually ever dealing with the root cause of violence, and that really troubles me. Um, as well as understanding that these laws, are, we we have reason to believe, based on the evidence from overseas, but also based on the scant evidence that we've been provided with here as to why they would be effective. Um, reason to believe that it's going to be marginalised women, especially First Nations women, who are going to be bearing the brunt of these laws through misidentification. Um, but also through, um, I, I guess, the tangential policing that occurs when um, people who have experienced domestic and family or sexual violence come into contact with policing systems that are driven to criminalise them for anything um, as soon as they're in contact with them. Um, and I think that's all I can say in the general on that. Yeah, I think it's, um, look, the criminalisation of coercive control is just an extension of pastoral feminist movement from decades ago, where the only response, it seems, is that um, people can only think about castle responses, right? Like, they're not thinking outside the bars, they're thinking from a very white, narrow uh, view of the world um, and take uh, don't take on board the issue of race, which is fundamental in in the first step of the argument or any argument. Um, but um, so this is an extension. Like I remember in the 90s fighting against carceral feminists to not legislate, not criminalise domestic and family violence because I said then uh, we are going to see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and poor white women actually criminalised and imprisoned. And sure enough, bang. The numbers went up drastically. It um, it was one of the top ten actual um, offences that Aboriginal and Torres Strait women were charged with in this jurisdiction was breaching a domestic violence order. Then we saw the lobbying of strangulation, right? Strangulation, because once again the lobby of the white castle feminists. Mm -hmm. Bang! It's enacted, and then now we see a number of women in prison being charged with strangulation. Strang I don't think that's a word, strangulation. Anyway, and then we see now the um, advocacy to criminalise coercive control, 
to criminalise a standalone DV offence and to actually implement, build and resource women-only police stations as a response to stop domestic violence, where we know that that will not. So we will see then women being criminalised for these new offences and we know that they will be brutalised if we have women-only police stations. We have seen in other countries where this has been taken as an idea um, where it doesn't work because if you speak to women on the ground who are victim survivors of horrific violence, the women's police st station turned away. And it's also actually coming from a premise that women aren't violent. I'm sorry, we're talking about the violence of policing. It doesn't matter how you identify. If you are part of the police state, you are part of the violence of policing. Um, and that is just a reality. And that's what we, we must defund. We cannot legalise our way and criminalise our way out of violence in this world. We must unpack harm. We must raise our children to not cause harm and to be able to respond to conflict that doesn't rely on castle responses. You know, like um, we see all the time, like, you know, I think of my granddaughters and, you know, if they refuse to put their seatbelt on because they're a bit older now, because they're like, nah, nah, nah. Most people, most families will say, well, the policeman's going to get you, you know, or, you know, something like that. And it's like we don't talk about police at all. It's talk about what is the harm? What can happen to you? What could happen to me? You know, we can't drive because this is about your safety. It's about reframing everything and not relying on the cops, castle responses. So um, people can have a look at um, Sister Society website or the Institute of Collaborative Re Race Research. We did joint submissions to the Task Force on Women's Safety and um, the criminal justice system that's happening here in Queensland. Um, we unpacked the terms of reference um, that's being used that fundamentally fails and is absolutely racist um, in regards to the framing of the whole issue. And um, so those papers are available and will assist you to understand um, what we're talking about. Because we know an Aboriginal women, Torres Strait Islander women, black women have um, spoken very powerfully around this country since the invasion and colonisation of this country about the violence perpetrated against their body and their families, their children, their communities. And that's who we must listen to. It's not the state, it's not the white castle feminists who put themselves above everybody else. We need to listen to the First Nations peoples of this country to drive the agenda and stand alongside and not step back when the violence of policing and prisons and child stealers come in, but step in front as the white lawyers so that they cannot cause harm to First Nations people. You know, you go to a protest, we know, it's not if, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will be violated by cops and violence will be perpetrated. Stand in front because I can guarantee you that the cops are not going to come at me as a white woman because if they do and that's filmed, many other people will come and advocate for me as a white woman because of the position of power that I hold in the community, but they're not going to care about an Aboriginal person, a Torres Strait Islander person being beaten and thrown in a paddy wagon and, you know, in the case of Latoya's brother, fella, a spit hood put on him and he dies. And five years on in that, you know, for Latoya, her brother, her family still has no answers, as many, other, you know, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people still have no answers about the killings of their loved family members. So it's time for you, me, as a white lawyer, to step up beside and stand in front when you know the perpetrators are coming. Put your body on the line. Put your whiteness on the line. So powerful. I, I wonder if, Alison, I'm wary of the time, I wonder if you might um, comment on, I think, what Debbie was saying about, you know, who we have to listen to and really using our privilege um, and, you know, the, the power that we have as lawyers. You've um, spoken a lot about the use of language and um, the, the um, particularly in the coronial inquest um, context. And I wonder if you might um, 
speak to that and, and speak about sort of some of the ways that you've seen that we can, um, you know, use language and, and the way that people can um, really, uh, you know, listen to the voices of people with lived experience? Absolutely. Um, so I, I know I've only got five minutes left. I'll keep it really brief. Um, the coronal inquest system is a really good example of how reformist reforms can get us in this endless process of review um, that often doesn't have tangible consequences. But um, the organisation, sorry, the organising of First Nations people who have lost loved ones to this system um, is does. Hope is a, a loaded word. It is galvanizing and it is escalating at the moment. Um, there's incredible work. Um, I mean, we keep coming back to this incredible, don't want to call it a win, this incredible moment that's happened in South Australia. It's been a product of five years um, of work from Latoya and their family after the loss of Wayne Fellow Morrison. Um, and that's work that comes from a, a place and a drive of love, understanding what this system takes away from us and precisely why the people who we lose to it are so valued and deserve so much more than the stories the system tells about them, either before or after they've passed away and we've lost them. Um, other organisations like the Dajwa Foundation to see families mobilising together so that um, they're not put into this reactive position that inquests often put them in, that makes them feel isolated, that trivialises them, that treats them as if their role is to hold a photo and look sad, um, but actually to, to make sure that they can lead with agency the story that's being told, the, the violent story that's being told about their loved one, not only to say, to, to contest that and to be like, this person was a beloved part of our community and they were more than this, um, this moment that took their life, but also that it wasn't a moment that took their life. It was a system and the system was represented by people who have names and who should be made to at least um, in South Australia, um, turn up to court and tell people what had happened. Um, and if I get emotional in this moment, it's because it's, there's this sense of um, momentum that I feel at the moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I looked at the list of attendees, which is um, probably a rude thing to do. And I, anonymity in conferences is a really nice thing. Um, but I recognise so many names who I know have been doing this work for so long. Debbie, I wanted to pay tribute to you as somebody who's been a critical part of driving um, even the name abolition, even the word abolition, constantly into something that's becoming feasible that a conference like this can reckon with. Something that seemed, I don't know, don't want to speak on your behalf, Debbie, but something that I at least think would have been unfeasible even as recently as a couple of years ago to have a generalist conference talking seriously about abolition and to have 300 people interested in discussing it and absorbing it. Um, but also the people on the list who I've seen doing the work that Debbie has described and that I have described, um, and to see us actually having those challenging conversations, to wrestling with something that requires a lot of us in the moment, but also requires us to have a lot of imagination and faith about the, what the world looks like, precisely because um, what we see in inquests is we, we know what's at stake and we care because they're loved. A powerful way to end. I don't know if Debbie, you want to say something um, as some last words to the to the audience. I don't know. I'm getting sad now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no. Sad's good. Um, you got to feel like. Um, I think that's the problem for many of us in this world. We push our emotions down, and we don't know how to care, love, and feel for each other as another human, right? Um, so it's okay to express sadness, um, grief. You know, and as I sit here on a Saturday, I think of all the women and girls languishing in prison around not just this country, but around the world and uh, and how they're trying to survive the most brutal experience of state violence, racist state violence. Um, I think the way that I would like to end is um, there was a, an Aboriginal rights group here in Queensland in the 1970s and Auntie Lilla Watson was part of that group and I want to leave you with their words. Um, 
it's the words that I always go back to myself. Um, these words are from a group of powerful Aboriginal people from this area, this jurisdiction. And they said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Let us, end quote, I'm saying now, please come with us and abolish the prison industrial complex so that we can all be free in the true sense of the word, free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie and Alison. I feel really um, blown away and I know that um, other people as well are just um, really blown away by the power of your words um, and the real, you know, challenge to us to step up and really listen and enact abolition in our in our lives and our practice. So um, thank you so much for speaking with us today.